A new leader for life? Following in the footsteps of Chairman Mao, one of the most brutal communist leaders the world has seen, is history about to repeat itself with Xi Jinping? In this special report, we look at what Xi Jinping's third term means for China and the world, what America can expect going forward, and if the free world is about to be embroiled in war. Welcome to China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Chinese leader Xi Jinping securing his third term, breaking from party traditions set by his predecessors. That's following the 20th National Party Congress, China's biggest political event that happens every five years. But as the event wrapped up, different focuses inside and outside China. While videos of former Chinese leader Hu Jintao reluctantly being led out of the party congress took Twitter and other social media platforms in the West by storm, in China, those clips were missing. Even searching for Hu's name on Weibo, China's Twitter-like platform, produced zero results. That gives a glimpse into China's heavily censored social media platforms. And state media inside China reported he was feeling unwell, but did not include the scene. Also coming under scrutiny, the fact that foreign press were able to witness and capture the scene, suggesting the message was for those outside China. China Affairs analyst Jason Ma gives some insight. Xi Jinping directed this play for a sole purpose, sending a clear signal that the era represented by former President Hu has completely ended in China, and China will enter a new era of Xi Jinping. But while the world focused on Hu Jintao, what happened inside China? China economic analyst Antonio Graceffo says first we have to look at the state of the economy. It's the fact that the Chinese economy right now is in the worst state that it has been in in many decades. Um, so my feeling is moving forward, I think we're going to see a, definitely a more aggressive Xi. Um, he reiterated during his opening speech, during the two-hour speech, he reiterated all the promises that he's made all along during the 10 years. Uh, number one, he'll improve the economy. Number two, he'll stamp out COVID. Number three, he'll stand up to the United States. And number four, he's going to reunify China um, and seems to be edging more towards saying that they'd be willing to use force to take Taiwan. Now, when it comes to following through on Xi Jinping's big claims, Graceffo says what worries him is... Now, he can't actually do anything about the economy. So I'm very concerned that the only thing he can really do after this converse is invade Taiwan. And I'm not saying that he'll do it tomorrow, but I'm saying that that is the only thing that he has complete control over. Before we get to Taiwan and how the international world could get embroiled, let's stick with China's economy for a minute. Graceffo notes. The, the real estate bubble is huge, but people do not know how big it is. They, all the, all, most of the mainstream media are underestimating the size of this problem. In addition to all of the direct real estate debt, there is $8 trillion, nearly $8 trillion of local government debt, which was issued against real estate sales. But real estate sales are down by 30% this year. So that alone is enough to tank the banking system. That $8 trillion in local government debt is on top of the real estate crisis, which totals around $350 billion. So we've got $350 billion that are in immediate peril. And then we've got this $8 trillion that everybody keeps forgetting is this local government debt. And it's not on the books of the federal government, it's on the books of the local governments. But at the end of the day, the local, the uh, central government may have to bail them out. So this could completely just take down the Chinese banking system. It could crash out the currency. Uh, you know, it could be really catastrophic. That's on the debt aspect. But noting Xi's speech and his doubling down on zero COVID, which is the policy of locking down whole districts anytime one single case of the CCP virus is detected, what does that mean for our economies? Markets weren't keen at the news, stocks plummeting across the Hong Kong Stock Exchange and the Chinese Yuan falling to a new low against the dollar. John Pelson, author of Wireless Wars, China's Dangerous Domination of 5G and How We're Fighting Back, 
notes when it comes to Xi Jinping's zero COVID policy. The zero COVID is a great example of how what's motivating uh, Xi's actions is not the common good of the people. Uh, it's it's all it all ultimately is about power. When he had the crackdown in Shanghai, I had friends in countries saying, "Do you know why he's doing this?" And they say Shanghai. After Hong Kong, Shanghai is the most Western, liberal, capitalistic city in the country. And this was Xi saying, you have to remember who's boss. He wasn't doing that to Beijing, which was just as troubled as far as COVID goes. But the crackdown went down in the most Western, liberal city. And it was a flexing of muscle. And, and yet there he is again killing the goose that lays a golden egg. The policy has already taken a massive toll on China's economy, as well as emotionally on the citizens. As for outside the country, China's zero-COVID policy has already strained the world's supply chains, as China is often dubbed the world's factory. But with the world's factory grinding to a halt under these lockdowns, where does that put us? We keep looking at this as if it's an economic or commercial struggle and tariffs and trade wars. It's a trade war without the trade part being in it. We have to recognize that even if we don't see this as a war, China does, and that's what matters. We have to we have to deal with it as just a war by other means, and that's uh, going to require sacrifice on our part. And uh, American companies, financial and and technological, may not like some of the consequences, but it's in. I think it's essential for our national security. Pelson notes the zero COVID policy gives us insight into how he operates. COVID is just one example of the damage he did to his own country because the value there is more strength and control than, uh, than success and, and flourishing uh, economy or, or so, uh, society. Given the state of China's economy and the country's status as the world's second largest economy behind the U.S., where is this headed? She can't wave a magic wand and improve the economy. You know, the way that they grew before and the way that they rescued themselves from the 2008 uh, uh, financial crisis was that, number one, uh, urbanizing, right? When you move people from the countryside to the city, each person's contribution to GDP quadruples. In other words, a farmer only earns a very small salary. Take that farmer, put him in the city in a factory, and now he's contributing much more to GDP. So by moving hundreds of millions of people out of the countryside into the cities, well, China was able to jump their GDP, increase it tremendously. Well, they can't do that again. There's just not that many people left in the countryside. Given China's economic woes, what can Xi Jinping do? Only quick thing she, uh, he can do, that she can do to make good on his promises is to invade Taiwan. And the other thing is that if you have a war, and they're already setting up for this, I've already seen it. If you read the party propaganda and you read between the lines, you might be able to guess at what they're planning to do. And they're already preparing. They already started the no food wasted uh, program last year. They mentioned that again this year, you know, don't waste your food. Um, they're already starting to blame their economic problems on the world, on the U.S. And all they have to do is make a war and then they can blame every problem on the war. And then it's not Xi Jinping's fault that, we, that they have economic crisis. It would be the fault of that war. And the war is there because America led the other countries astray. As for waging an actual war, Bradley Thayer, founding member of the Committee on the Present Danger China and co-author of Understanding the China Threat, says he can only do that if his domestic affairs are in order. But what that means is that Xi Jinping will now have established uh, his control over the party and that dissidents or elements which are opposed to him are really uh, neutered or under his control. Uh, he's, he's ensured that he's dominant. And thus, the party's control over China is as well. So we should expect a far more active and belligerent uh, Xi Jinping after the 20th Party Congress. As for the domestic affairs part, Xi Jinping stacked his party with his loyalists, essentially surrounding himself with yes men. Meanwhile, Premier Li Keqiang and Wang Yang, a member of the Politburo Standing Committee, were reshuffled out. Both were pro-reform and opening up China's economy. 
But it's not just about loyalists. It's also about ideology. Thayer has argued before that for Xi Jinping, that ideological control is twofold. Firstly, maintaining an ideological purity within his own party, as opposed to followers of former Chinese leader Jiang Zemin, for example, as well as influencing the rest of the world's ideology. Now, as for why the Chinese regime balks at the idea of America's ideology, Thayer notes the CCP. It knows it's illegitimate and it, it wants to destroy alternatives uh, to it. It knows that the West has provided uh, a better lifestyle, a better a political organization, economic organization, social econo uh, uh, organization. The West went through women's rights movements, it went through civil rights movements. Uh, China will never go through that under the Chinese regime. Uh, and so the Chinese regime recognizes that it's illegitimate and alternatives the better future promised by the West is a direct threat to that legitimacy. So it's fearful uh, of the West and it seeks uh, uh, to destroy it. Now, this also applies to Taiwan. That's all for today's China in Focus on YouTube. We're now sharing a shortened version of our program here after being demonetized for more than a year. Coming up in our second half, we hear more from experts on what that emphasis on ideology means for China and the rest of the globe. Will we see a more aggressive Beijing in terms of Taiwan? And what does Xi Jinping's third term mean for U.S. priorities going forward? The full episode is available on our partner platform, Epoch TV. To sign up, click the link down below. Thanks for watching China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. See you tomorrow. Shen Yun Creations, the streaming platform from Shen Yun, featuring world-class dance, past programs, and all original music. Masterclasses, behind the scenes, comedy, and more. Explore ShenYunCreations.com.